Whew. Okay, so what is this video about? There's a thing going around Twitter at the moment where people are sharing lists of their favorite 20 or 25 games of all time. And I recently jumped on the bandwagon with this list of my 20 games. It got me thinking about how all these games have made an impact on me, not just as a player, but also as a designer. And I realized that it's exactly the kind of thing I'd like to talk about on this channel. So in this video, I'm going to talk about 10 of those games, and I'm not going to talk about them in terms of trying to convince you uh, that any of them are the best games or whatever, but instead I'm going to talk in a very personal way about how they've influenced me and my design values and consequently my career. I'm going to try and keep this video fairly short, given that it's me rambling on about 10 games that I really love, but we'll see how this goes. Um, what, what's the first game that I'm going to talk about? Doom. Of course, I've got to talk about Doom. Not only was it an amazing, groundbreaking game at the time, but it's also the game to get me into level design and realize how much I enjoyed that. It surprised me that a few people in our community who are level designers and who like shooters haven't played the original Doom games. To me, it's like being into films and sci-fi, but having not watched Star Wars. You know, why, why would you do this? I do still genuinely recommend Doom to people as a game, especially if you're into level design, because it wasn't just important because of a big technological leap at the time or something like that, even though it was. It still has its own unique style and spirit when it comes to level design. You can do things, and the game does do things, that you just can't do in other games because of realism or story or believable architecture or whatever. There's a, there's a fun abstractness to Doom levels and the way it plays with your expectations and kind of throws crazy surprises at you that you just can't get away with, uh, or it doesn't really fit into other games. Anyway, so of course Doom is on the list. The next game on my list isn't actually a video game. It's a part of the fighting fantasy choose your own adventure book series that uh, Steve Jackson and Ian Livingstone wrote. Confronted by fire-breathing gorgons, you can look in your pack for something to offer them. Turn to page 36, or turn to page 90, draw your sword and fight them. Yeah, these books made a real impression on me because while I was playing video games on my Sega Master System, stuff like Shinobi and I don't know, Double Dragon, Golden Axe. I was also playing fighting fantasy books and thinking about nonlinear narrative and explicit choices and consequences and interactive storytelling and, you know, branching structure and all this kind of thing, which there wasn't any of in the video games I was playing at the time. I remember I got thinking about writing my own fighting fantasy book as a kid and thinking about how many pages I would have to do in different sections and how they would have to connect and how many branching points I would have to have and stuff like this. And uh, the reason I picked The Citadel of Chaos, which is just one of like 50 of these books, it had a magic system that I really liked and kind of created interesting choices. And also there's an illustration from the start of the book that I'll, I'll just never forget. It was an encounter where you meet this ape dog and a dog ape. And that image has stuck with me because it was so evocative of like this crazy cool world that this book was set, you know, took place in. And it really spoke to the power of like combining an image with text to create this world in your mind that you kind of, you couldn't do with just either one. So these fighting fantasy books basically got me into thinking about designing games with nonlinear structure. And they really changed my fundamental idea about what interactivity is and what games can and should be. You can see that influence in stuff like Dishonored 2 that I worked on. To me, the fundamental interesting thing about Dishonored is the non-linearity, and it is the kind of very subjective way you experience those levels. And also things like the notes. I was always very conscious, coming from the Fighting Fantasy books, how when you read text, it can show you things and make you imagine things that you can't show in 3D. So yeah, fighting fantasy books, a huge deal for me. And I suppose the takeaway is how important it can be to have influences outside of the stuff that you work on. Next one is SimCity. SimCity 2000 takes city planning to a new level of realism that pushes the limits of today's high-powered computers. Sim-sational 3D perspectives and 256 color graphics let you build cities that look so real you may want to move there yourself. 
I love SimCity. I think it's kind of, in its own way, one of the most beautiful things that video games have done in terms of being kind of showcasing the power of simulation to create an interesting, fun thing to play with that can also be quite insightful and give us a different perspective on whatever it's simulating. I used to play it as a kid at my friend's house on, a, on his uh, Acorn 3000 computer, which you'll only know about if you're British and, and old. Now, the first thing you'll see is the BBC A3000 desktop. If you don't see this, then check that all your leads are properly connected. I used to live in a village called Thorntondale, and my mum would drive me and my brother and sister to school in a town called Pickering, two miles away. And on the way to that town, there was an industrial estate. I realised that I understood what a, an industrial estate is because of SimCity. And I also understood why it was where it was, on the outskirts of town, in between these two residential villages and towns. Because, of course, in SimCity, I was placing industrial estates away from the residential areas. Nobody wants to live in an industrial estate, and it pollutes the area, and it reduces land value, and all that kind of thing. At some point as a kid, I realised that I was learning things about real life from playing SimCity. And it kind of, on some level, it, it opened my eyes to the idea that video games can be a positive thing, and not just like a fun distraction or, a, you know, a cool, exciting thing. They can be educational and positive. And I kind of wish that that kind of simulation that can have an educational aspect was a bigger thing in games in our industry. An interesting thing about these games, and Will Wright, he went to a Montessori school, which is kind of a particular kind of school where kids are encouraged to learn intuitively on their own terms through play. And through that lens, you can see that all of the Sims games, SimCity, The Sims, Spore, Sim Ant, all of these things, they're all essentially Montessori toys in the video game age. Basically, the reason why I make toys like this is because I think if there's one difference I could possibly make in the world uh, that I would choose to make, it's that I would like to somehow give people just a little bit better calibration on long-term thinking, because I think most of the problems that our world is faced right now is the result of short-term thinking and the fact that it's so hard for us to think 50, 100 years, or 1,000 years out. And I think by giving kids toys like this and letting them replay dynamics, you know, very long-term dynamics over the short term and getting some sense of what we're doing now, what it's going to be like in 100 years, I think probably is the most effective thing I can be doing probably to help the world. The next on the list is virtual racing, which is basically there to represent my love of arcade games. People talk about the golden era of arcade games as being the 80s, with like Pac-Man and Space Invaders, Defender and all these things. But to me, the golden era of arcade games was the later end of 2D games and the transition into 3D. I remember the very first time that I saw virtual racing in the arcade. I just suddenly saw this four car machine, like the four player version of virtual racing. And you've got to remember that like before virtual racing, racing games at the arcade looks like pole position. And super hang on. and Super Monaco GP. That was probably the most realistic one. And going from that to virtual racing, with this fully 3D kind of world and the first person view in the cockpit and the camera buttons that you can use to smoothly switch to the, uh, the helicopter camera, it felt like a completely new era of games, you know. And unfortunately, arcade games now are rubbish. Uh, they barely exist because nobody plays them anymore. And I feel like we've genuinely lost something there because arcade games, especially in the era that I'm talking about, they always had new controllers and new interfaces that the game was completely designed around. And that feeling of every new game having its new controller and being a completely different experience um, is just something we don't have anymore. And you just don't have that magic of the arcade where you could climb into an afterburner machine and it would swing you around when, as you're steering. Or you could, you could climb onto the horses in Final Furlong. Classic stuff that we just literally don't even try to make anymore, which is a bit sad. About that beer I owed you. 
It's me, Gordon. Barney from Black Mesa. Half-Life 2. If you watch my videos, you know that I'm a big fan of Half-Life 2. I still kind of recommend it as one of the best uh, things to start making levels for if you like these kind of games. It was such a big jump for me because I kind of missed Half-Life 1. It kind of passed me by. For some reason, I just didn't get into it. With my brains and your brawn, we'll make an excellent team. Whereas 2 just was right up my street. I loved it. I loved where the episodes went with it. Gordon, there's something snooping around out here. Oh my god. It made me think, like, I want to work on this kind of thing in the industry. And in terms of the more story-driven, immersive first-person shooter stuff, it kind of paved my way towards immersive sims, which I'll talk about now because the next game on the list is Dishonored 1. So I was kind of late to the immersive sim thing in a way. Back when I was making Doom levels as a kid and Quake levels, a couple of my friends were playing things like System Shock and Thief. <laughs> And I remember seeing Thief and thinking, oh, that looks pretty cool. It's a, good, it's a good idea for a game. And I remember reading reviews and hearing my friends talk about System Shock. Like weird, weird, cool stuff happening in System Shock. But I never played them. I was too busy kind of in the id software, Doom and Quake world, making levels for those games. And then I think my kind of proper introduction to immersive sims in general was Deus Ex. But I kind of bounced off it. Coming from the world of Doom and Quake and Half-Life, Deus Ex struck me as a bit kind of complicated and hard to get into and stuff. I was young and stupid. I apologize. You've got 10 seconds to beat it before I add you to the list of NSF casualties. Easy, bro. Just having us a conversation. Five seconds. I loved what it was. And I think partly because of my fighting fantasy thing that I talked about, the Choose Your Own Adventure books, I loved the idea of an immersive first-person game that had all this choice and non-linearity and kind of interesting conversations and that kind of stuff going on. But Deus Ex didn't quite land for me. But when I became a huge fan of Half-Life 2, I remember thinking, surely the holy grail or the sweet spot is something in between the production values and the accessibility of Half-Life 2 and the kind of non-linearity and the writing and the complexity and the richness of Deus Ex. Surely something can happen between there. And then jump ahead a few years later when I'm working on Bioshock Infinite as a level designer, Dishonored 1 comes out and I'm like, holy shit, that's the game. That is the production values of Half-Life 2 with the complexity and the richness of Deus Ex. Are you trying to guess which one is which? I was thinking of sneaking upstairs to look for clues. And a year later, I, I'd applied to Arcane and done the test, and uh, I was moving to France to work on Dishonored 2, which I'm really happy about. I'm really happy to have kind of worked on a game in that genre and with those, that style. I just had to work on a game like that. Next up, Silent Hill 2. In my restless dreams, I see that town. Silent Hill. And again, I kind of bounced off it in its early days because Silent Hill 2 is a game that is easy to get lost and stuck in because of its kind of unconventional structure and stuff. And I'm really good at getting lost and stuck in games and I hate getting lost and stuck in games. So I often bounce off quickly if that kind of happens. But I kept reading so much about how good Silent Hill 2 was. And I remember I watched the documentary that came with the special edition version and it seemed awesome. Like right of my street. You know, shaking people's heart deeply means, uh, you know, uncover people's core emotion and their core motivation for life. Everybody is uh, thinking and uh, concerning about uh, sex and death. And uh, if we want to uh, scare or uh, shake or touch uh, then we have to uh, think about sex and death deeply. And so I went back to it a couple of times and the second time I completed it and then I read a book that kind of deconstructed what the story was about and all this kind of thing. And it's basically brilliant in a way that I think of as cinematic. 
And I don't mean that as in it's linear or the aspect ratio is cinematic and it's all shot from cinematic cameras or any of that, you know? What I mean is that it feels cinematic in terms of its atmosphere and its artistic purity and ambition and how rich and deep its characters were in terms of the themes and ideas that they represent. It doesn't matter who I am. I'm here for you, James. See? I'm real. All the metaphorical side of that once I realized what was going on in that game and the, and the ambiguity, how well judged the ambiguity is. All of those things, I don't think games usually do very well, but Silent Hill 2 totally does. Number eight on this list is The Last Express, which is an old 90s adventure game. It's very 90s. Really, like, there's nothing like it for some reason, because I think it's a game that should be ripped off more often. It's a first-person immersive adventure game, but it's all drawn in 2D and kind of rotoscoped from real people. And the cool thing about it is that it takes place on the Orient Express in like 1910 or something like that. And every carriage of the train is simulated in real time. Bonsoir, monsieur. We have a nice table for you here in the corner. If you will please uh, follow me. So if you're on carriage two, talking to somebody there, please, monsieur. you're theoretically missing out on stuff that could be happening in carriage six and stuff like that. And it just creates a really unique sense of being in a real place, which combines really nicely with the writing and the tone of the game, because it it's got quite a unique feeling. It feels more literary and kind of inspired by the real world, basically, than most games are. I suppose you could kind of say it has the vibe of an Agatha Christie novel. Tyler. Basically, there's nothing quite like it. And I always love games that kind of simulate small contained spaces, but in way more depth than, than games typically do, and kind of explore interactive story stuff within that very small, tight world. It's really interesting and I recommend you play it. Especially if you like the whole immersive first-person adventure thing because The Last Express is quite a singular, unique take on it. Next up is Metal Gear Solid. And I love the first game in particular and games one, two, and three as a trilogy, narratively. And it really is a trilogy in my mind. Like the fourth and the fifth are their own weird thing. Um, one, two, and three kind of structurally and thematically connect up in a really interesting way. But the first game was another one of those games that felt like a huge leap to me. Um, it probably helped that I was also getting into films at the time. Um, you know, The Matrix came out, DVDs just started coming out. And so suddenly I was buying these DVDs and watching all the extras and learning about how films were made to some degree and just becoming a bit of a film geek. And so Metal Gear Solid comes along. And to me at the time, it showed me that games can be everything that film are and more because they're interactive. And to this day, the first game is still one of my favorite examples of what I think of as cinematic level design in the sense that every section of Metal Gear Solid 1 feels like a unique set piece that drives the story and relates to the characters in a unique way. It doesn't feel like a game full of 30 generic levels that just reuse the game's core mechanics over and over again with tougher enemies or something like that. There's just so much stuff in Metal Gear Solid from like the Psycho Mantis stuff that everybody knows about with him reading your mind and your memory card and shaking the controller. I will show you my psychokinetic power. Put your controller on the floor and you changing the part and stuff like this to trick him. But also stuff like the first time you fight alongside Meryl. What are you waiting for? Shoot! Don't talk to me like a rookie! Fighting the Hind D with a rocket launcher on the rooftop. Uh, the sniper battle against Sniper Wolf trying to pick out Meryl from a room full of patrolling guards based on the way she walks. Thanks for the help. Wait! 
fighting liquid snake on top of the Metal Gear Rex at the end. The car chase that finishes things off. Using the ketchup in the prison cell to fake your death and fight your way out of the cell. What the hell? Just non-stop interesting ideas. There's a bit with an endless square staircase where you just, you need to get to the top of the building to fight the hand D. And it's just an endless staircase with loads of buddies coming at you. But it's so simple and pure and repetitive that it becomes its own thing. It becomes like the first video game version of that scene in Old Boy where he just fights his whole way from left to right. It felt dramatic through its simplicity. I think as an immersive sim guy, I'm supposed to say that Thief is my favourite stealth game of all time. But secretly, it's Metal Gear Solid. Snake, are you okay? Snake? Snake? Alright, last one, number 10, is Ikaruga. Which is a super hardcore Japanese old school bullet hell shooter. You know, a vertical scrolling shoot em up. I played Ikaruga on the GameCube but originally it was an arcade game. What I love about Ikaruga is that to me, it's really great at two completely different things, almost opposite things. Because on one hand, it's like a super hardcore Japanese arcade game, super elegant mechanics, endlessly deep in its score system, and you can learn to play this game better for the rest of your life. A really interesting example of emergent gameplay, a masterclass in traditional gameplay design. But it's also, with its black and white colour changing thing which pervades the whole game. The whole thing is like a weirdly pure interactive metaphor for yin yang and the, the, the concept of it, the philosophical ideal of flowing between these two states in order to overcome everything that comes your way. I like it so much that I'm already working on a video about why it's interesting. Hopefully you'll see what I mean in that video. It's really quite a thing. So those were 10 of the games that have made the biggest impact on me as a game designer. I hope that was interesting and not just completely self-indulgent on my part. Cheers for watching and take it easy. See ya.